Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our lesson in Daniel. As you realize this whole month, we have been studying the book of Daniel, and there's a lot of good meat and a lot of good things that we can put into practice in our own lives. So today, we are having the story about the lion's den. And have you noticed, I will also put the scripture up here for you to read. So you know what um, scriptures we are studying. So before we begin, let's go into prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you and praise you for this day. I also thank you for this story of Daniel. And there's so much in here for us, Lord, to learn and understand. I just pray for your Holy Spirit to help us and just be with each and every one of us and open our hearts and our minds to understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, hey, here we begin. This section is titled, The Lost May Be Jealous of the Success Our Excellent Character and Work Ethnic Brings Us. So if you want to take some time, pause and read this part, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, go ahead. Okay, as we continue here, let's look at this scripture, especially verse 3. It says, Daniel was so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Wow. Daniel has still remained faithful. He is still self-disciplined and he has shown his integrity and his character over this time. Now, I want you to remember Daniel, when he was captured, was among the other um, intelligent, well-rounded people of Jerusalem of the time when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. He was in his late teens and early 20s. He had a future, a very bright future before him. But then when Babylon came and captured Jerusalem and he was taken captive, and taken back to Babylon, he was there for about 70 years. So that is a long time to be in captivity, isn't it? I also want you to realize what Daniel had to endure for those 70 years. Now remember, he still was faithful to God and he had to navigate his faithfulness to God with this new culture that he was in. And this culture did everything they could to assimilate Daniel into their beliefs, but he did not. He kept faithful to God. You also need to realize in ancient civilizations, there were um, things that they did to control people. And there were things that Daniel could not control. Um, one of the things was when Daniel was captive, they actually, um, he became a eunuch. And what that is, is it's a surgical procedure, I guess we can say today. It basically removed his manhood. So Daniel, if you realize, he was never married. He never had any children. He couldn't by this time because the culture that took him captivity wanted to control as much as they could over him. And that was one thing they did. They castrated him and he then became a eunuch. So he was like that for 70 years. Also, by this time of this story, Daniel is 80 years old. He is no longer a young man. And he is still doing what he is supposed to do for the Lord. So if we also look at verse four here, it says that the administrators wanted to find grounds or charges for Daniel against his what he was doing. They didn't like him ruling over them. You know, they thought, here is this Jewish exile and he is over us. They didn't want that. So they were trying to come up with a plan. But no matter what they tried to catch Daniel in, it says here in verse 4, that his conduct of government affairs were, there was no corruption to be found. They could not find anything that he did wrong. So 
finally they thought, you know, the only way we can get him is if it's pertaining to his God. So that's what we need to do. So the administrators got to got together and went to King Darius. Now remember, a lot of the rulers of that time were very prideful and they thought very highly of himself. So they were able to play into that. And if you notice, they said to them, hey, let's issue an edict and enforce the decree that everyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, um, shall be thrown into the lion's den. And the king issued the decree and put it in writing that it could not be altered. And especially those who are going into seventh grade, when you study ancient civilizations with Mrs. Kerstetter, you're going to see that a lot of edicts that were written in ancient times could not be reversed. It, once it was written, it was done. It had to be followed through. And if you read the book of Esther, that is what happened with Esther and her people when wicked Haman um, wanted to get rid of the Jewish population of that time in that area. He got um, King Xerxes to do an edict and not realizing that his Queen Esther was Jewish. So they couldn't um, reverse that edict. So what he had to do was put out another edict to say the Jewish people could defend themselves. And that is how they got the Feast of Purim because the Jewish people were able to overcome and do well there with that. So that's something you can read about Esther. So that is what happened. Now, here are some questions. Work hard and do what is right, understanding that some will not like it. Here are some things, the questions you can think about. Why do you think some people dislike those who work hard and do right? How should we deal with people who dislike us or mistreat us because we are trying to do right? Let's face it, life is not fair, is it? People should like others who work hard and do what is right. However, that is sometimes not the case. Jealousy rears its ugly head, causing people to act in ways that are not even logical. And isn't that the truth? You can see that today. You can see it politically. You can see it socially, like on Facebook. You put something out there and people just go crazy over it. So we need to step back and have God help us to look at something the way God wants us to. But why would anyone dislike someone who tried to treat everyone nicely, who respected teachers and authority, or who studied for tests or did their homework? Doing the right thing is not always easy. And sometimes it may feel like everyone is against you, but it is always right. Being a young person of character will cause you to stand out. Some people will like you and respect you more because of your integrity, but others may react negatively. negatively excuse me, negatively. Doing excellent work with an excellent spirit may not make us popular with our co-workers or fellow students, but it brings glory to God and should be our goal as followers of Christ. It's not, not the truth. So it's something for us to think about. Okay, our next section that we're looking at is Daniel chapter 6 verses 10 to 18. And that's titled, our faithfulness to God may cost us dearly. So take some time to read that scripture and come back. Okay, well, now here we have Daniel has learned about the decree. What is he going to do? Is he going to do it secretly? Is he not going to do it at all? No, remember. Daniel is 80 years old. He has faithfully served the living God his whole life. He is not going to stop now. And I like how he, how he did this after he learned about it. He went up to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. So. He, that didn't stop him. He did it anyway. And if you think about it, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul writes, Cease 
uh, well, praying without ceasing, okay? Praying without ceasing. So that means that we should be in prayer all the time. How can we do that? You know, we are faced with so many decisions that we need to be made daily, or we come across people that we um, talk to all the time. There are times that you can do a prayer, quickly send it up. Oh Lord, just you know, be with the emergency personnel, be with the person, you know, or Lord, help me make this right decision. Should I really do this or not do this? So yes, you can pray without ceasing. It's how you approach your decision making throughout the day. Okay, so here's Daniel. He's up in his room and he is praying. And these men, they know how to get him. They see him doing this. And what did they do? They hightail it to the king. And they're like, hey, king, guess what? You know, you wrote this edict that no one could pray to anything but you for 30 days. And guess what? Daniel's up there praying to his God. He has broken your law. Well, the king here said, you know, darn, I made this decree. Now I can't pedal back. I can't, you know, rescind it. I have to follow through with it. And the kings, they said to the king, Daniel is one of the exiles and he paid no attention to you. So the king here is when he heard this, he was greatly distressed. And he tried everything the rest of the day. He looked for loopholes. He tried to find other ways to get Daniel out of the situation. Why did he try this? Because he knew Daniel was a great person. He knew that he was also a leader that did wonderful things, what he was in charge of. This king knew he could depend on Daniel. And you don't want to get rid of your good workers by throwing them to the, the lines. You want to keep these good workers because it was a bonus for him. But it, it didn't work. There was nothing he could do. So the king gave the order that Daniel to bring Daniel and throw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, this is the last thing he said to Daniel before it was sealed. It said, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. So that's what they did. They put the stone, they rolled it over. And back then, they would put a seal on it. So that way, when they went to open it the next day, they knew someone didn't mess with it and get Daniel out, you know, ahead of time. So that was how they left it. And that king went home. And, you know, if you notice here, he spent the night without eating, without entertainment, and without sleep. And that is a big thing. Back then in ancient civilizations, having eating and entertainment was like a constant. And for this king not to do this, you can see how troubled he was, okay? And he also realized he was tricked by the other administrators. And you're gonna see what happens to his anger the next day. So that's where we are with that. Here are some questions. Work hard and do what is right, understanding that some will not like it. So why, oh, I'm sorry, wrong questions. We did that before. Here we go. Do right and leave the consequences to God. And this is easier said than done sometimes. Have you ever encountered a situation in which you knew there would be a consequence if you did what was right? And have you ever made the wrong choice? Hmm, think about it. How does it feel to put the consequence in God's hands? You know, it can be hard, can it? How do you know you can trust him? Well, you can trust him for what he has done for you before. So do what is right. It sounds so simple, yet we often make it so difficult. We think through the positives and negatives. We weigh our options and then we still cannot decide what to do. Because of our sinful nature, it is impossible to live a perfect and sinless life. Thus, we need Jesus. Through him, we can make good choices and put the consequences in his hands. We can do what is right because we have committed to him 
that we would, but we could also call on him for forgiveness when we make the wrong choice, which is a good thing. So God knows we're not perfect. He knows we'll make some bad choices. But the good thing is we can ask for forgiveness and ask him to help us to make better choices next time. And that is so true. And it is hard. It's hard to to follow through what you think God wants you to do and not try to jump ahead of him. Just to rest in his peace and knowing that he, he has it. Okay. Our next, and this is our last verses that we have, is Daniel chapter 6, verse 19 to 28. If you want to stop and come back there, and then we can discuss those verses. Okay. Okay, here we go. Well, the next day, at first light of dawn, have you seen? The king didn't take his time. It says he got up and hurried to the lion's den. He was just waiting to see what was going to happen. You know, was Daniel alive? You know, did he lose his most trusted advisor that he really thought a lot of because of his own dumbness of listening to those other administrators? Okay, so here he comes and he yells, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Now, can you imagine the next few seconds of either anticipation or the stress that that king was going through until he heard Daniel's voice? Daniel yells back, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. Oh, my word. The king was so overjoyed, and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. Okay? And do you remember it? Meshach, um, Abednego, and I'm trying to think. Shadrach, Meshach, okay, and Bendigo, when they came out of the furnace, remember, they weren't even singed. They didn't even smell like smoke from the fire. When they looked at Daniel, he had not even a scratch on him. So now it was time to deal with the conspirators, those people who wanted Daniel to be taken down. And here we have to see what did they do? Okay, the first thing that they did wrong, okay, the first thing, they lied to the king. They lied to the king. Okay, they lied. They misrepresented the decree, the edict, okay? They weren't doing it for the benefit of the king. They were doing it to get rid of Daniel. Next, they conspired. They conspired to deprive. To deprive. King Darius, his most trusted and valued advisor. Okay, so that did not sit well with the king. So what did the king decide to do? At the king's command, the man brought who had falsely accused Daniel and threw, those, threw them into the lion's den along with their wives and children. Okay, I just want to let you know, that does not make God happy that all those people got punished for those few men that did what they did. But you also have to realize we are getting a little look into ancient civilization, political power. Okay, so that is what how they would handle situations of that time. So, but here's another thing. Remember, Daniel is 80 years old. He is in a lion's den. How many lions are there? You know, was there one? Was there four? Were there 20? Look at these verses here. Now, not only were the men who were accused 
of doing wrong thrown in there, but also their wives and their children. And look at the verses soon after that. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. So before they even hit the floor, they were dead. So you can even imagine how many lions are in there, you know, and for the amount of people that were there. Okay. So once this has happened, then we have, oh, here's another thought about those family members that were killed along with the people who were the who were the people that were that did wrong this is something we need to remember we ourselves cannot avoid the principle that our families might gain or suffer from our own conduct okay you might think that whatever you do is just going to affect you but it isn't it's going to affect your family, your friends, maybe even strangers, okay? It's something you need to be aware of. Like you might be in a car thinking, hey, this is fine. I got my license. I'm driving. And you might, if you're not paying attention, if you're texting or on your phone and you get in an accident, it doesn't just affect you. It affects whoever you hit and whatever happens after that. That's why we need to be so careful what we're doing. When I was in my early 20s, I thought, Hey, I don't care what anybody does as long as it doesn't affect me. As I got older and be, um, became more mature, I realized that is not true. There are things that people do that indirectly affect me. And so that's why we need to keep others um, better, you know, keep doing, other, doing for others before us. So we help everybody. So that's something to think about. So. Here we have King Darius then rejoicing at what God has done. And he ends up acknowledging what, who and what God is at that generations of Babylon, Babylonians before this denied who God was. And think about it. He says here in verse 26, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. You know, here, he unbelievable. He just acknowledged who God was. And after this, Daniel then prospered during the reign of Darius. You know, so, and he lived it to be about 90, give or take. So he never went back to Jerusalem. He died in Babylon. But he had a powerful 70 years there in a culture and a region that he was not, you know, didn't expect to be in, but he was in. And he honored God in everything he said and did. So here are some questions for us to look at here. Trust God to work all things out for our good and his glory. So what do you think it means to say that God can work out all things for our good and his glory? Does that mean that even bad things can be good? They can, yeah. What does it look like to trust God when bad things happen? Life is hard sometimes, and that is definitely an understatement. Everyone faces difficulties in life, and it is important to realize that the only way to get through hard times, such as an unexpected death, a divorce, relation ship problems or other tragic circumstances is by trusting in God. Trusting in God when bad things happen does not solve the problem. Instead, it means that as bad things can be or as bad as a person feels, there is a deep seated knowledge or peace that God has a plan. It means knowing he can even take a tragedy and bring about good, not necessarily right away and bring glory to himself he can also bring comfort healing and peace he sees the big picture and knows what we do not and we must only trust him and it's something true about daniel of what um we have been learning about daniel now this is from the elementary lesson but it's showing us parts of daniel that are good 
that maybe we should be more aware of in our own lives. For example, remember in the first part with the food issue in the beginning of the book? Daniel had self-discipline and he followed through. And that's something that we all should have, especially with the way school is going to be done this time. We really need to be self-disciplined so we can get all our work done. And then courage, that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the courage that they had to stand up for their faith and what they wanted to do to honor God. And then Daniel, with the interpreting of the dreams, he was humble. He had humility. Um, humility is recognizing we need God and are willing to do what he says. So are you humble? Do you have humility? It can be a tough thing, but it's a good thing to have. Faithful, and that was today. We are where we are supposed to be and doing what we are supposed to do. And that can be really hard. I know it's really tough, this pandemic and people losing their jobs and the mask issue, and it's all crazy. But I want you to realize, now for me, it would probably be my grandmother and great-grandmother. And probably for you, it probably would be your great-grandmother and your great-great-grandmother or your grandparents. But think about a span of 30 years in their lives. Think about it. 30 years. Around the early 1900s, they had World War I. And then soon after World War I, in 1918, they had the flu pandemic. And soon after that, there was the stock market crash, and then Prohibition, and then the Great Depression, and then World War II. So within a span of 30 years, there was so much going on in the world. And that is why they're called the greatest generation, because of what they had to get through and um, get to the other side. So that's something that two other lessons there that we can learn from. You know, we might have it bad now, but back then in a span of 30 years, it was pretty rough. One thing after another. So I just want to let you know, we're not the only generation going through this. There has been others before. We can learn lessons from them to make this better and how to go pursue it, you know, or to go through it. So it's something to think about. So that is our lesson today for Daniel. Next week, we're going to be talking about reverence of Daniel. Um, Tammy will have the lesson. I just hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, take care of yourselves. Prepare yourselves for school. Get ready. Um, also, I hope your parents are able to um, get themselves ready too for school. It's going to be different. So just be aware that you that you are in our prayers. And I just pray that this week, as you go about your business, you see God working in your lives and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to make those difficult decisions. Okay. So until next week, take care of yourselves. Remember, God loves you and wants the best for you. And until then, take care.